Hello and welcome to Batcast 66. It is usually the podcast where each episode we talk about an episode of the 60s Batman show. Uh, but for Batman Day, we're going to do something a little bit different. My name's Kendall. And I'm Scott. Scott, what are we doing today? Uh, well, in honor of Batman Day, we decided to talk about some of our favorite Batman comics. Um, you know, we're not just a fan of the 66 Batman show. You know, we've been reading comics for, oh my God, over 20 years, you know. And uh, Batman's one of those characters that goes between him and Spider-Man, which is my favorite superhero. And uh, I thought, hey, you know, we have a Batman podcast. There's a Batman Day. I have a comic book store. We should probably talk about Batman Day, do something for Batman Day. And this kind of made the most sense. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Um, I have some weird picks i feel like and um, i have some pretty pretty pedestrian picks i would say yeah well we'll cover the whole the whole bat spectrum yeah well i mean god there's so much right how can we yeah i mean i barely scratched the surface of just how many batman comics have been produced over like uh he's like 85 or something now like he's over 80 he's pretty old yeah and he's still doing this yeah i don't know how but I guess uh, I'll I'll start off if you don't mind. Um, yeah, go on ahead. I think my favorite Batman story is uh, Batman: The Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale. Um, I know that's a common enough pick, but like it tells a, a a mystery over the course of a year in relation to holidays. So it starts on Halloween and ends on Halloween, which is why it's the Long Halloween. Um, but it goes through Batman's like whole Rogues Gallery. Uh, it kind of served as the inspiration for like the Dark Knight. So it's got like it's Batman Gordon and Harvey Dent are trying to like solve the mystery. And by the end, Harvey Dent becomes Two Face. I don't know. It's really good. It's really noir. And like the mystery, I think, is a uh, really compelling in it. Um, I don't want to talk about it too much because I do. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Um, and it has a couple of follow ups. It's got Dark Victory and like Haunted Night. So if you do like it, there's more you can get. Um, yeah i i i mean i do love and i'm glad you brought brought it up um yeah. i do love those books yeah I, I so tim sales art on its own is not something i would be into but it really works for that story i think yeah, it's so stylistic it's i i love it yeah but I think if you just showed me the art, I probably wouldn't like it. But like, it works really well in uh, in execution in tandem with the story on it. And the follow ups are the other books that they did, like Dark Victory and stuff, are good. They're just not as strong, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean this this is such a good story, and I know Jeff Loeb is like a kind of contentious writer. Yeah, I am not usually a fan of things that he writes, but when he when he's on his A game, it's good. Well, I feel like he had, didn't his like son die or something? Yeah, something tragic happened. Yeah, and I feel I like after that. that he wasn't the same writer because he's done other things. I like he did that Superman Batman book that like wasn't perfect, but was a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember that too. He also did like um, Superman for all season. Like he's done good stuff. And then he did like, ultimates three and yeah like red white and blue or something yeah yeah i feel like this team has had a lot of like fun runs yeah, they did yeah they did also did superman for all seasons together too which was really good did they do a spider-man book yeah oh yeah they did all the spider-man blue hulk gray daredevil yellow captain america white the only one of those I've actually read is the Daredevil one. It was really good. Awesome. Yeah, I I haven't read any of their Marvel stuff, but yeah, that's a great pick. Puts Calendar Man on the map. Yeah, Calendar Man's great in it. I wonder if we it's, get him in the sixty six show. He's like perfect for that. I don't. He has. He's such a goofy Silver Age character. He had to have existed by then. <laughs> like in the comics. Like, I know the reason we don't get, like, Poison Ivy and Bane and Harley Quinn in the show is, like, they didn't exist yet. Yeah, of course. Um, but, yeah, so what, what's one of your picks there? So, um, I guess I'll start off with 
a two-part Batman story. It's called What Happened to the Cape Crusader. Oh, yeah, I've read that. It's been a minute since I read it, but I remember really liking it. Yeah, it's um, written by Neil Gaiman and drawn by Andy Cooper. Um, and it came out around the time, like, Batman R.I.P. was a thing, I feel like. Yeah, as I remember, this is sort of a spiritual successor to uh, Superman For All Tomorrows. I forget what exactly what it's called. What, but it came out what happened in the that... world? Or what yeah, yeah, what happened to Man of Tomorrow, that's what it was. Which was kind of a send-off to the Golden Age Superman. And this feels like they were trying to do a similar thing for Batman. So, and... yeah, well, what's in so... The framing of these two issues, which um, it's Batman issue 686 is part one and part two is Detective Comics 853. It's been a minute since I picked up uh, some superhero books. Do comics still do this? Like part one's in this book. And then yeah, two they, they just wrapped up a Ghost Rider Wolverine crossover like that. Oh, well, cool. Yeah. I I know it's just a tactic to sell more books, but I do think if done well, it's a lot of fun. It can be. Generally, I do not like it, but that's no bearing on like the quality of the books you're talking about. This one made sense. It was also only two issues. I think they came out like a week after each other. Yeah. If I'm remembering they're correctly. They're right on top of each other. Yeah. And like, they're, so, just, they're just two Batman books. So it's not like a crazy ask. Oh, yeah. It. By the extra one it's not like a s- event it's just yeah. a story yeah um which is maybe what comics need but anyway um so yeah the framing device uh for this story is batman's funeral and we get a lot of like interesting it it's re- it's out of continuity for sure um so Maybe if that is something that's really important to you, don't bother. But yeah, it has Batman's extended cast all visiting him, you know, saying their goodbyes to him at his funeral. Uh, And there's like a couple weird tidbits, like even the characters themselves in this story, like don't come from the same continuity. Because it's not like just the Golden Age Batman or just the Silver Age or even just the Bronze Age. Like we have Barbara Gordon is very much in a wheelchair as she was, you know, during that that age of comics. But yeah, everyone has like a story to tell as they visit Batman. And it's usually just a page or two. One of the more interesting ones is uh, Alfred's story uh, in which he reveals that he was the Joker the entire time. (laughs) And like, he just felt like Master Bruce needed a, like a demon to focus his energy on. So he just kept dressing up as the Joker and going to commit crimes it's it's pretty interesting. And you, they call out in the book, like, Alfred can't be the Joker. The Joker's right over there. Yeah. Is. Um, yeah. It's, it's kind of like every era of Batman is saying goodbye to the concept of the character. Yes. Because I know that Alfred Joker thing, like, has always been a fan theory that, like, all of the villains are created by Alfred to give Batman something to do. You know? pretty funny but yeah i think it's a beautiful story and i'm sure i bought batman i definitely bought batman comics after this but this was like the last time i was like whoa sick yeah because that was yeah because it was definitely after the irp so like that was like the end of the grant morrison run which i didn't enjoy but i think you were reading at the time right yeah i think i i don't think i'm gonna talk about it here but i do enjoy the grant morrison run and i think oh, plenty yeah. of yeah, it wasn't for me. Grant Morrison stuff for me is very hit or miss. Um, and that was a miss for me, which is fine. But like, I remember, you know, Ken and I have been reading comics together for decades. So I do remember you buying those books at that time. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, some more recent stuff for Batman I've read uh, that I really enjoyed. 
Um, we just mentioned, you know, Barbara Gordon being in a wheelchair. So they did a series of uh, one shots for the villains, um, kind of inspired by Batman the Killing Joke. Called, they called it Batman One Bad Day. Um, now, each book was like a different creative team um, and each focused on a different villain. So they're not all of the same quality, but it was a really kind of a cool thing. So like uh, it was what? What was it? It was a. Uh, Riddler, Penguin, Two Face, Mister Freeze, Catwoman, Razzle Ghoul, Clayface, and Bane uh, were all the different one shots. And like, you could argue there's maybe a couple of like major Batman villains that didn't do like Poison Ivy. But, like, I don't know. It's kind of cool how they focused on Clayface and like just basically like all of their. It gets it digs d- deeper into their motivations and like their origins. Like Penguin's story is. He's returning to Gotham after having been like ousted as the leader of like his criminal empire. And he has to kind of build, like he starts off with one gun and one bullet and kind of has to like build himself back up, which includes a confrontation with Batman. We has to basically convince Batman, like, cause crime's gone, gone a lot higher since Penguin hasn't been there. And he's like, I kept all of these other elements under control. You may not admit it to yourself, but like, you need me to do this. And then Batman oh. kind of like steps away. There's like, but they, they get into a lot of stuff like that. They're really good. Um, and there's like a big box set, and you can buy them all now. Um, but I, I really enjoyed them. Uh, they're the ones I've read most recently. Like I just finished reading those like last week. Cool. And and those are at level up right now. Yeah, I have them at the store. Um, I think they were coming out over the course of last year. They started putting them in like hardcovers. Um, and there's like a box set you can buy. Oh, we also have the individual ones. If you're just like, I'm only interested in Catwoman, you can just buy that one. Cool. But they're all they're all they're all good, and they're all told for like a more somber and mature tone. Um, obviously, the Penguin one was my favorite because he's my favorite Batman villain. But the Riddler one was also really good. Um, it really they like dives more into like we talk about like the Riddler's like really creepy in this show. It kind of gets into like that part of him a little bit more cool. yeah maybe i'll check these out since you all have them there yeah i and if you ever want i mean if you specifically want to borrow them you can borrow them from me cool yeah leave it for someone else to to pick up yeah, yeah. what you all got right. a comic book i got a comic book yeah. uh, so this is pretty goofy not that the story is i mean it's batman so it's inherently goofy but um It wasn't written to be goofy. It's just a silly pick for me. So my first, do you remember your first Batman comics? I, I, before I can't really remember the first Batman thing I picked up was at least when I started getting into comics was a silver age collection called like the Batman's greatest stories or his greatest stories ever told or something, which was just a bunch of random silver age Batman books. But I don't remember the actual like issue I picked up first. Mine, I had, I guess, I think my mom had gotten me like a two pack. Like they used to like, I guess, repackage comics that didn't sell and Mm -hmm. like sell them as two packs at like KB Toys, if you remember this. Oh, I I remember this year of of comic packs very well. So the two pack I got, some of my first comics, um... It was this issue I have in my hands, uh, Batman issue 470, which is, uh, it's the story is called War of the Gods. It's a Maxi Zeus story. That's awesome. Probably the only Maxi Zeus story I've ever read. <laughs> but it's, it's pretty cool. The art is amazing. Uh, the penciler is Norm Brayfogle. Which I don't is know him. what a what a name. Yeah. And then Rich uh Burchett is the anchor, which is another name I haven't really heard of. And it's like Batman's face, like whenever he's like, like, unless he's talking to Robin in this, um his face is just like in shadow and he's so terrifying. I I just have always, like, loved this. The other issue, which I no longer own, I don't know what happened to it, was uh, 
a Scarface story. Interesting. And like, I remember they, at the end of the issue, they like put some, they put this guy, they like give this guy cement shoes and dump them in the river. And I remember feeling so unsettled that like somebody had like drowned. Like, and like the bad guys at the end are just like on the loose. And like, I didn't have like the, the awareness to be like, oh, like I'm sure in the next issue, Batman will get them. I was say, wow, how how young were you when you had these? Oh, I was a, I was very young. Okay, um, like learning to read. That's insane. Ah. but yeah, just like great art and like definitely big nostalgia vibes for me. That's cool. Uh, one of the other books I. Because there's a lot of books I do want to talk about. One of the ones I wanted to talk about is another book I, I read recently that's also like a relatively recent book. It's Batman and Jason. It's a Catwoman Lonely City by Cliff Chang, which I know you picked up, Kendall, but I think you said you didn't read yet, right? Yeah, it's been um just you know how it goes, comic readers. Yeah, I've got something a- just you don't have time. Yeah, I'm I'm years behind on my current issues, but um the, the premise, so I don't want to get into it with spoilers uh, yet. But first off, I love Cliff Chang's art. He's one of my favorite like artists working today. So good. So the really premise is, good. yeah. Uh, the premise is, it's like the future, like Catwoman's an older lady. Um, she wasn't, she just got out of jail for, she was arrested for having murdered Batman. Um, which it's not a spoiler. Like it's very clear early on that she didn't. But you don't know, like, they don't reveal to what actually happened until, like, later. Um, but because of that, like, Bruce Wayne left, like, his money to, like, this the city to fight crime. So, like, it's all, it shows, again, how Batman could do more good with his money than he could as Batman. But, like, so it kind of, she needs to get involved in, like, one last caper. And she kind of has to put together a crew of, like, older, tired supervillains. So you kind of get to see what happens to everybody, like, later. And everyone's, like, older. Like Killer Crocs, like got bad back and stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a lot of that kind of like it's stuff I relate to now as an adult. Um, and just like yeah, their their way of doing things is now like outmoded. But I I don't want to go into more detail than that because it is worth experiencing for yourself. And it's not a super long read. It was like three oversized issues long. Um, but the hardcover's out now. And if you can pick that up, I suggest it. But it's really Ooh, good. yeah. Another. I'll get to that. I was to say, just because I didn't have a lot to say about that, another recent hardcover I picked up, uh, again, which is a recent book, came out was the, the Batman 89 comic, which is a follow up to the Batman 89 movie and Batman Returns. Um, I picked it up because I love Joe Quinones' art. Um, like all of the actors, or all the characters in it look like the actors and everything. Um, and it's written by the guy who wrote the first Batman movie. Um, it's really good. It follows up on like Harvey Dent. And like he's clearly Billy D. Williams in this, so um, again, it's really good. It's, and especially Kendall, I know you are a fan of the Batman eighty nine movie. Oh yeah, I love it. So if you haven't read this yet, it's definitely worth picking up. The Superman one's also really good, and they just solicited uh, the sequel comics for it. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, uh, I saw yeah the sequel to the Batman eighty nine one that's going to have Scarecrow right. Yeah, it's going to have Scarecrow because I think that was the next villain Tim Burton wanted to use, like back Ooh. in the day. Like I know they're following up on Two Face in this because they had already set up like Billy D Williams as Harvey Dent in the movies, and it also introduces Robin as well. But it's it's very different versions of both of them, and it's really it's really good. Hell yeah. Yeah, I got to get on reading the. I remember when they were announced, I was like kind of excited and just never got around to picking them up. Well, part of the problem was like there kept being big delays between issues of the Batman book. So if you were picking it up as it was coming out, like it took forever. Yeah, oh, not surprising. That's comics, baby. Yeah. All right. Um, My next book is uh, a mini series and it's the... I'm not sure the exact year. Let's see. The first issue is cover dated January of 91. It was probably November of 90, 1990 then. Because for some reason, DC and Marvel books, their published date on that is always two months in advance from their actual release. Interesting. 
Yeah, it's really weird. Everything else is like the right time. So it must be like some sort of ancient newsstand thing that they just kept up with. Probably. Maybe that's like tells people when to pull the issues and send them back. Maybe. It might be something like that. I've done no research into this. I just know it's annoying when I have to pull the six-month-old books at the store. Mm. Um. So yeah, it's the Robin miniseries from that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not the introduction of the Tim Drake Robin, but kind of the first time, like, it's like about his training. Uh, it separates him from Batman. And he ends up like going on this journey and like meeting Lady Shiva and getting wrapped up with this gang. I believe they're called the Ghost Dragons. I don't know if these characters have appeared recently at all. But uh, I know Lady Shiva shows up every once in a while because I think she's the mother of another DC character. I think she's that one Green Arrow's mom. Oh, whoa. I think so. I could be mixing up my uh, female assassins in DC. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't really know. I, I know she was the one who kind of, I don't think she debuted in this, but I more mean like the Ghost Dragon. So they were like the villains. There's like uh, this dude, King Snake, who's this blonde white guy who's the master of martial arts in yeah. the East, which is silly. And yeah, it's it's about Batman or who, Robin, the Tim Drake Robin, kind of foiling their devices and kind of being deceived by Shiva. It's a lot of fun. It, it sets up another... Uh, I guess, more nostalgic based pick of me, which is this, like, I think it was a three part series called shadow box. It was another one of those like discount three pack books. And yeah, it's a King snake comes back and he wants to kill Tim Drake because when lady Shiva killed, like beat him up, she was like dressed in a Robin costume and, He's crazy. I mean, it's probably some Lazarus pit shit. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. The one thing about this is it's uh, written by Chuck Dixon, who's a pretty problematic creator these days. Yeah. But yeah, this kind of kicks off like this. Uh, basically, the, the Tim Drake like expands on him as a character. And uh, despite all his faults, Chuck Dixon was with the character for a long time, really fleshed him out and yeah. made a character that people love today. He was probably the most complex Robin at the time. For sure. Like I know uh, uh, Dick became Nightwing and like became more of his own character after that in Teen Titans. But, you know, he's, he wasn't Robin at that point. Like this, this guy's Tim Drake was still related to Batman. It's kind of sad. Like, since Jason Todd came back and like Damien became a thing, it feels like they never know what to do with Tim Drake. Yeah. They, they keep trying to like reinvent him. I know he was red Robin for a little bit. I personally hated that. Yeah. I didn't like that either. And then he went back to being Robin and there were just two Robins. And I think that was okay. But yeah. And then like, uh, What's that guy's name? Bendis made him a character called Drake. Yeah. I, I don't know. That, like I said, it feels like they don't know what to do with him. But like he is a fan favorite character, so they don't want to just get rid of him. Yeah. He's probably my favorite Robin. Yeah. But again, I'm uh I'm way behind on my bat. I haven't bought a bat book since like Grant Morrison was writing. Yeah, I think we've I don't know if we've talked about it on Batcast yet, but like, I I know at least the older I get, the less interested I am in picking up monthly like books from the big two. But I have talked about a few recent releases I've really enjoyed. Like I I, I kind of perform prefer more of like Elseworlds or like self contained stories, where like the end can be, not doesn't have to go back to a status quo. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Although speaking of that. So I don't think you, I know you read at least some of this, but uh, how much of the, how many of the Batman Ninja Turtles crossovers did you read? Oh, yeah. Uh, I've read all. Oh, yeah. All right. I wasn't sure if you. If I've you, read all four of them. 
Oh yeah, I read all four of them as well, but three of them are only going to be ones I'm talking about now. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely all right. So I don't know if this come up on Batcast, but if you listen to our other podcast, we talk about the Ninja Turtles all the time. Like they're some of our favorite like comic characters ever. Um, For sure. So when they crossed over with Batman, I was really excited. Uh, James Tynion wrote them, who's one of my favorite writers. And Freddie Williams III drew him, who's one of my favorite artists. So it was like a match made in heaven. Um, they did three volumes uh, together. Uh, the first one, after it was done, I think it said, I said it was everything I could have wanted in a crossover between the two, where the Turtles come to like the DC Universe and get stuck in Gotham City. Um, so they have to team up with Batman against some of his villains. And then, because the Shredder's there, uh, up to some something. Uh, but eventually mutagen gets involved and all of batman's villains mutate into animals and they all have to team up and fight them i don't know it was just like i was like oh i was like so excited like everything i could have wanted the second one where like really cool yeah the second one where bane goes to new york isn't as cool but like it does delve deep more into like character growth and then the third one is also really cool where it becomes like an amalgam universe and i love that all of the turtles are a different robin yes uh, yeah, but basically, yeah, they have to fight Krang, who's, like, merged the universes, so they have to team up with their original incarnations. So, like, Golden Age Batman, and then Kevin Eastman drawing the original Ninja Turtles, like, in black and white, like, on the same page as all of these characters is really cool. Uh, it, they're really, really fun, and uh, they did put out an omnibus now, so you can get all three in one shot. They did do, like, an all-ages book where it was, like, the, the at-the-time CGI Nickelodeon show teamed up with Batman, the animated series characters, but like it wasn't nearly as good. I I had a lot of fun with that one. I had fun with all three of them. Yeah. Uh, probably my least favorite one is part two. Yeah, it's mine as well, but it's not terrible. Like we get to have Bebop and Rocksteady. So I'm happy. But yeah, being yeah. taken over the foot in like the Ninja Turtles world isn't as interesting. Although they did have to team up with Shredder, which is kind of cool. But yeah, I think... I'm just so much less interested in Bane than... Yeah. He was a weird pick as, like, the central antagonist. Yeah. Like, the other two are, like, Shredder and Krang, who are pretty uh, major Ninja Turtles villains. But then again, like, if it was the Joker, like, I don't think that would have been interesting. I don't know what Batman yeah. villain supported both. I mean, I get it. It's, um... I mean, I think Bane works more in favor of the story they were trying to tell because it was like, wasn't it Donnie who yeah, like... Don, Donnie was like the main character and he kind of fell in with them. Yeah, because he was like feeling like he needed the venom to like be yeah. on par with his brothers or something. Yeah, it was cool. I, it's been a minute since I reread that one. I probably will reread them all again soon now that we're talking about it. Yeah, I'd like to give them a reread. And Adventures. I think that was just a really fun idea yeah it was a fun idea and i'm glad that they made a comic that's more approachable for children not that there's anything so bad in this but like it's definitely not made with kids in mind because that is one thing that like annoys me about comic books in general is like they don't really make things that like are accessible for younger readers i'm mean, granted those books you were mentioning earlier you read as a little kid and like it didn't turn you off of anything yeah well also like People cared about continuity back then, but like there seems to be this obsession with so like not saying I never cared about continuity, but like I never felt the need to like go back and like read Batman number one to like understand like it's easy to understand what's going on. Oh yeah. And that's one of the things I love about Batman comics. Um <laughs> is like we're all familiar enough with like the origin and premise you can kind of just jump in, you know? Yeah, and, like, you might be confused about some things. Like, um, in these comics, uh, because I was familiar with the Batman 66 movie, like, I knew who Dick Grayson was. But, like, in those comics that I read, like, everyone was calling Robin Tin. And, like, I was like, what is this? Like, why yeah. are they calling him that? And then, like, yeah, you find out eventually, but like the confusion wasn't enough to like hurt my enjoyment of it. I was gonna say like one of the things I really liked when I was getting into comics like that 
as being like, oh, that's like I remember one of the first things I read was like um, when I was getting into comics as a as a young as a teenager is I picked up like a wizard magazine. It had like the hundred best graphic novels in it. And I kind of use that as a guide. Uh, so I picked up like Marvel Secret Wars and like so Iron Man never takes off his costume in that and you find out that like there's something about like the prejudice with the mutants and he says to himself like something like oh man if they ever found out there was a black man in here I'm like what the hell does that mean I, like Iron Man's a white guy and I found out that like oh Rhodey is Iron Man at this period and like that made me interested then like I went then followed that thread and read like some of those comics you know like that's part of what's there's like a fun discovery element as well yeah i yeah i think people take it too seriously like oh i'll never know where to start and it's just like if you're interested just pick up whatever looks cool yeah that's always been my recommendation and most comic books usually have a recap page or something in the very beginning to get you up enough with speed what you know for this story but like yeah. superheroes in general, like the big the big two Marvel and DC, like you have to know enough about them already that like you can just jump in. You don't need to know every single person Batman's fought, but you just know he's Bruce Wayne, his parents were killed, he dresses as a bat. Like you're good to go. Yeah. And if the story is good, you'll be able to Yeah, you'll pick up on it. Yeah. You'll get enjoyment out of it. Yeah. And and if you want to pick up on those threads, they're there. And one of the cool things about like batman and this is more of a general dc versus marvel thing is a lot of the stories we're recommending are like really standalone and you can just pick up a trade paperback of that like you don't need to know his origin for like long halloween you can just pick that up and it's a complete story and you're good to go you know like the batman ninja turtles you don't need to have read either of those books but like you get the concept of those characters and you can just read them you know that's one of the things i like about that versus marvel doesn't put out trade paperbacks in the same way yeah. Like, there's not, like, a Spider-Man story I can just hand you. Which is a shame, right? Yeah. Like, there's a couple, but there's usually, like, a weird caveat with them. Like, I love Spider-Man life story, but, like, it's the, as if Peter Parker had aged. So it's not, like, a normal Spider-Man story. Like, I can't just hand you, like, Maximum Carnage, because you have to know, like, all of these other weird 90s characters in it. Yeah, who aren't as, like, prominent. Who, like, stopped being important after that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm gonna come out and say Maximum Carnage is probably oh, like oh, I haven't read it since like we were in high school, but it's probably trash. Oh, it's pretty bad. Um, but like I have a nostalgic connection to that when I was first getting into comics, like those were the back issues parts I was always looking for because, like, oh, this is part four or whatever, because it was like 12 parts throughout like four Spider Man books. I was like, oh, neat, like I can pick this one up. This is one of the things it gave me something to look for. Yeah, no, it's definitely fun. Yeah. But the story's not very good. Most things from the 90s weren't, in my opinion. But um, anyway, we got a little off topic there. Um, I got any other uh, bat books to recommend? I guess continuing down my Robin phase, it's, again, just a single issue, but We Are Robin issue four, probably one of the most, like, beautiful looking bat books ever the art style might not be for everybody but um it's drawn by james harvey who i think i think he makes very interesting looking books um so there's like a lot going on there's a lot of like collage like digital collage going on uh and it follows so we are robin was this book that I thought was very interesting until uh, this owls is some there's some crossover that Looking really took owls. the piss. Out. See, oh, uh, that's what, that's that's one of the books I would recommend for Batman. It was a, like some co- sort of sequel to Court of the Owls, and oh, it was okay. all about like people with the mantle of Robin. So I feel like the book, like the crossover, went through like Nightwing and the current Robin series. And then We Are Robin. Mm -hmm. We Are Robin, the initial premise was, it was just a bunch of young kids who were inspired by Robin to like do something in there to kind of take a little bit of control of like the crime happening in their neighborhoods. 
like because Batman and Robin can't be everywhere. So they formed this like network and they were all they all used the code name Robin. Uh, but this issue follows a Robin named Rico uh, and just it's about her meeting Batgirl. Which one? Um, I think this was. Oh, yeah. It's definitely Barbara Gordon. It's like during the time where she it was like a new 52. Was it the, she's like back to, yeah, she's back to being walking. It's not the Batgirl Burnside era, is it? It is. It is okay. that era. Yeah. OK. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. The The series is a lot of fun and very interesting. But this one, it's the only issue um, James Harvey drew. And it just is really good looking and worth tracking down. Number four, right? Number four. If I, yeah, if I were to sell my run of this, I would keep this book. Okay, that's cool. Uh, what do you got? Let's see. I've also got, uh, well, you're talking about Quarter Owls. So the beginning of the New 52 run on Batman, the, the Scott Snyder run, is really, really good. Um, and the first two trades are about the new villains, the Court of Owls, um, who kind of always had, like, they're a retcon, like, they've kind of always been in the shadows in Gotham, and, like, they were responsible for, like, a lot of Batman's, like, unsolved cases. So he accidentally just stumbles on the conspiracy of them, but, like, they're really, really cool. And I remember at the time, I was like, this is going to be one of those, like, it felt special at the moment. I was like, this is one of those stories that whenever they do, like, a new interpretation of Batman, like, as a cartoon or something, these char- these these characters will be in that. Like they've, I mean, granted they use them for a comedic take in like the Harley Quinn show, but yeah, they they've they've kind of broken through into like general Batman like lexicon, or like the Batman zeitgeist for like recurring elements and characters. Um, it's been a minute since I read them, but I don't so I don't know if it holds up. But I remember. There's this one issue where like they have Batman captured like in like a like a maze or something, but like to read it, like you have to turn the book physically around. And like it kind of gets you into like how confused he is at the moment. Um, I don't know, it was really cool. I really enjoyed it. Um, one of the highlights of the new 52 era, which there's precious few. Yeah, I remember when it was coming out, like everyone was raving about it. But I, I just, I was so anti New Fifty Two. Yeah, like I thought it looked like twenty first century, like Image Comics. Uh, there is a lot of elements that are uh, accurate with that statement. Yeah, and by Image, I mean like I love, I and I even love early Image Comics, but like, Oof. just like why are we doing this? I mean, I get why they did it. They wanted to have a new easy entry point for new readers i I just mean like that kind of style oh yeah that's a that's a different conversation but like it was very edgy (laughs) yeah i think they were just trying to appeal to a new audience and i think that's not what makes dc good and it might have been because like they might have tried to have some parody with like the upcoming like Zack snyder movies which i also think were a terrible idea like what makes dc like fun to me is like there is an element of like corniness like if you lean it's into corny. it yeah you lean into it like it's great like we have a whole podcast about how much we love the adam west batman show so yeah. so yeah it's uh i don't know it, it's a shame but i'm happy to know like good things came out of that oh yeah there's a couple of books i really enjoyed from that time period but we're talking about batman and I liked it for a really long time. And then I think I just needed to make cuts. And like, if it wasn't a book I was in love in love with, I cut it. So I stopped getting it at a certain point, but there was no like, Oh, this is where it got bad. You know? Yeah. I I mean, there's some things like, I remember reading. Well, anyway, I mean, this, this is going on a tangent. Yeah. But like what, once I, uh, I guess like got over it. Yeah. Um, there were some books like uh there's like this detective comics run. Detective Comics is really good. Yeah, that was James Tynan. Is that like when the, it was a team? Yeah, with like, like Clayface. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was really good. I got really drunk and talked to James Tynan about that once. 
Hell yeah, sick. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is I feel like that owl stuff was going on forever. It it eventually crossed over into all of the Bat Family books for a little bit, which is annoying. I hate that in general. But um, and also because all of it's so superfluous to the main story, and it just interrupts whatever was going on in the like the books they were they were interrupting. Just like we are, Robin. I feel like it never recovered yeah. from that. Yeah, there's been many runs of comics that like that kill like that kind of stuff kills them, and it's real. And it makes like going back and rereading them like suck. It's like all of a sudden like like I went I got I got into Cable Deadpool way after the fact and like. Every once in a while, I have to deal with like all of these stupid Marvel events, and it's just like, ah, I was just doing its own thing. But now I have to deal with like Civil War, and now they fight each other, or getting into Peter David's X Factor way after the fact, like I did, because they're like so barely related to the X Men. But occasionally, like, Wolverine would have to show up and be like, "God, me and Cyclops had a divorce," like, and they're like, "Okay, why are you telling us? Go away." And then they go back to their own books. Yeah, there's a lot of. Um, like, even, like, most recently, I was giving the Krakoa-era X-Men a shot, and as soon as we got to that, like, Ten of Swords or X of Swords, whatever yeah. it was, as soon as we got there, I was just like, this sucks. Yeah, and you had to buy a thousand books. Yeah, and, and it was like, uh, I'm not going to do that, but it was impossible to carry, like, I was yeah. like, oh, I don't know who these people are. Yeah. Like you literally had to buy every X family book when that was coming out because part one was in one, part two was in another. And it stinks. I I don't like that stuff. But that's all right, well, that's a different podcast. True. So yeah, I see you got another uh book to recommend there, which is a, a very good pick. I'm very excited. I kind of would like to go into this, like give it its own episode. I know this is one of the books we were one of the things we're talking about doing a, a special episode of Batcast about. But yeah, um, Jiro Kawada's Bat Manga. Also um, I ran concurrently in the late 60s. Yeah, it's, I mean, God, I, manga artists, mangaka. Yeah. You know, they blow me away because, the like, of course, there's a bunch of speed lines wherever there can be, but this comic looks amazing the whole way through. And it's not, like story content, it's it's fun, but it's pretty basic. Kind of light, yeah. Yeah, it's just like oh, like you barely see Bruce and Dick in this. Like it's mostly just Batman fighting a new villain for like three or four issues. Um, the most popular, of course, is uh, Lord Deathman. Lord Deathman, such an awesome name. Such an awesome name. Such a cool story. Uh, it really feels like an old, um, like, common Rider episode. You know what I'm saying? It's got big Sentai vibes. Yeah, or, I sentai mean... Sentai Tokusatsu, sorry. Yeah, it, it's... Yeah, they're not... It's like a less flashy, like, less sci-fi-driven Tokusatsu. Yeah. A lot of fun. I was really excited they adapted uh, Lord Deathman into an episode of uh, Batman the Brave and the Bold. Yeah, he also Batman... got an issue... And the, the okay. Batman 66 comics, yeah, which is also exciting. Because that's one of those things where it's like, I don't know the legality of how much DC can or can't use those characters from that book. It feels weird to me that Lord Deathman, as popular as he is, has not really been used a lot. That's one of those things, like, I'm not sure if they how much they're allowed to use him. Or yeah. if they have to pay, pay for his appearances, so they only wanted to do it like when it was like kind of special. Yeah, I mean that would make sense. Yeah, but we'll we'll definitely dig into at least the first volume of that uh in a in a more dedicated episode. I know that was one of the ones we've been talking about doing. And uh I haven't reread it in a while, so like it would be fun to kind of revisit. Yeah, I, I'd be excited to to reread those for sure. And I, I own all three volumes. I don't think I've even opened the third one, so yeah, I only got volume one. I missed out on the other two, and now they're not like in print anymore. Again, I think they might have to. Obviously, I think they have to pay the mangaka for it. Um, so I don't think I don't know how well they sold initially. So, but I am glad that they did officially bring them over in English because they were kind of always like an infamous, like obscure piece of Batman. 
like lore, you know? Yeah. Hard to get your hands on. Yeah, like there would be they were the kind of things like early internet would have like rumblings about. And then like DC just this week as of recording, like just published like a bunch more of like the weird mangas that they've been had like I guess licensing out in Japan. Like the one where like Batman turns into a baby, so the Joker has to raise him and like Superman eats a bunch of Japanese food and stuff. Weird. They're really yeah. weird. There's um there's some there's this image of I wonder it might be a like a a doujinshi like a, a bootleg comic, but it's like Superman has like a lion's head. Have you ever uh, seen this? I mean that's a silver age thing. There was like a lion headed Superman. Oh, okay. Maybe it's maybe I'm just thinking of like a tra- translated to Japanese copy of that or something. Maybe. Uh well, what else do you got? Um, the only other book I was gonna bring up is uh, Batman Hush. Um, I love it for a lot of the reasons I do. Uh, Long Halloween. Well, it's kind of like this longer, like overarching mystery. Um, but it dealt. It brought in like a lot of Batman's Rogues Gallery over the course of it. Um, and it's drawn by Jim Lee. And when like when he was at the top of his game, so it's like really, really like nice to look at. And it's just one of those. Like kind of quintessential Batman stories. Like it's one of those again, another one of those perfect ones where like I can kind of hand it to somebody, no matter what level of like investment they've had into like comic dumb, and they will be able to enjoy it. Yeah, I think the only thing that might trip up a new reader is the uh l- little uh clay little, face. Yeah, it's a little twist there, but I think that even if you don't get it, like there's enough setup that you can. Like it might not have the same impact as if you've been reading Batman since the eighties, but I think he would. Uh, I th- I think it's still like appreciable on just about for just about any reader. Yeah, I love I, and I feel like the love for Hush maybe has diminished overall, but I, I, I can. See that. I like I Hush at the time. I so it's just would... oh god. Uh, so how I first got into Hush is a weird story. So my mom was a librarian, and at the time, I went to some sort of librarian convention with her, and, like, DC Comics was there as, like, a publisher, and they just had, like, a shitload of issues of that They just you could get for free. Cool. So I got them for free. Nice. And I was like, this is so awesome. Because, yeah, I think they want, you know, because they want you to buy it for your library and stuff, so they had, like, samples and things. So I was like, this is really cool. And then I went and tracked down the missing issues I, had, I didn't have. And that was kind of about when I was, I'd already started getting comics on the regular, but like that came out like about when we were in high school. So like that was when like I had to go pick up back issues and stuff for a story like that, you know? Yeah. So that, I don't know if I had gotten into buying comics really. Cause like, I, you know, like I'd start week, super, you know? Yeah. what's that? But like week to week. Yeah, I definitely wasn't doing that because I'd started with superhero comics very young. And then in like middle school, I moved to like manga pretty much exclusively. Mm -hmm. But hush, I remember somebody in like my biology class, which is definitely like giving away our ages, but someone in our biology class had the poison ivy like superman issue yeah and it, it we weren't enemies but we weren't friends either and i asked him i was like hey can i read that cuz our biology teacher very much was uninterested in being a teacher and would just like give us study hall so he could like take a nap <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read the whole issue in class and I was just like, whoa, like superhero comics are cool. <laughs> yeah. It, it was know, cool, I, yeah. I knew, and it was like all familiar characters. Like it wasn't weird to me that Batman and Catwoman were kind of on the same side. I like got Poison Ivy's get, uh, like deal. Like, she was familiar to me from the animated series. Yeah. It's like, of course you know Superman. 
it was sick. And yeah, I think that's like a big reason I was like, maybe I'll try buying some comics again. Yeah. So then I know, and I know by the time senior year came around, like us and our friend group would go to comic stores every Wednesday. Yeah. We would each have our own books that we'd read and then we would swap them with each other. So we all got to read even more books. Yeah. Wednesdays were a lot of fun. Yeah. Wednesdays was our big day to hang out. I used to keep track on a, on a calendar in my bedroom, like what books came out each day. So I knew oh, which ones awesome. to play. Cause we didn't do like pulse uh, subscription or anything yet at the time. Yeah, we were just scooping them up as we saw them. Yeah. But I was like, ooh, I've, I've been... I think back to those days and yeah. like my tastes now and like my tastes then. And I remember like looking at like books I currently enjoy and just being like, what is this? This looks weird. And yeah, I that... think about that that era too, but like I was really excited for all of those books and like yeah, it was one of those things where, like, I, I think about it on that time, and it just it was just different, and like, my tastes have very much evolved since then. Um, but there's still stuff from that time period that, like, maybe I don't, I wouldn't love right now if I read them for the first time, but like, I have a, a weird nostalgic connection to, you know, like, man, that was back when like Marvel events were like really ramping up with Bendis writing everything. Oh yeah, Ugh. yeah. Um... I, that's when I started getting really acquainted with a uh, extreme disappointment in uh, events. It was just too many, too much all the time. Yeah. I'm just And then yeah. like each individual book would like, it's like, okay, like you mean to tell me the X-Men are doing this insane thing. And then at the same time, like their school is being blown up. Yeah. But it um, was, a, it was a different time. And I think back on, I do think back on that time fondly. There's, one more thing I want to bring up. Sure. I guess this is like a bonus one. This is definitely not a Batman book. Yeah. It's uh so it's an indie book called uh Nat Rat. Okay. Um and there's a collection called the Ultimate Nat Rat that Fanographics put out a number of years ago. I don't know if it's still available uh, as far as i know it's not like super popular or anything but uh basically the whole comic it's done by mark martin who scott would definitely be familiar with from their mirage ninja turtles work mm -hmm. uh but ultimate nat rat is um it's a it's about a millionaire rat who lives in this like forest like community uh and his name is boo swain <laughs> um and it's basically making fun of frank miller superhero comics which is it's always like good a, to make fun of yeah so for most of the comics Bruce Wayne is like a uh, Batman parody. Um, and then like he gets blind halfway through and he's temporarily like a daredevil mm -hmm. parody before going back to being the, the Batman parody. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. He crosses over with the Ninja Turtles in their book. Uh it's just insanity. What else besides uh, that crossover? What other Ninja Turtles stuff did he do at Mirage? So it's like a three issue story, but it didn't come out in sequence. Um, I forget the exact issue numbers. Let me see. Is it from like Tales or like back when it was doing like the uh, guest artist era? It was the guest artist era. So he did T Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issues 16, 22, and 23. And like the turtles meet this. Um, it it kind of opens like an issue of Tales. Like it opens with like there's a, like a little girl, like, let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. But like, She's really like a mutant from the future or something. And like, there's a lot of time travel shenanigans. The turtles end up like 
their bodies end up like getting disintegrated and like splinter like builds these robot bodies for them i think i know what story you're talking about yeah like one of the issues has like splinter dressed in like a as a waiter on the cover yeah i think i have that one yeah that's when the crossover happens okay is he supposed to be like an alfred parody in that because in the the batman into turtles number three he is mixed with alfred oh that's pretty funny yeah (laughs) Um, I I forget the logistics, but yeah, I I'm holding up this uh turtles collection, and yeah, like there's Nat Rat. I remember him. Yep. Yeah, I, I remember Nat Rat. I and I remember you telling me about that Nat Rat comic like on its own before. Yeah, and like it's yeah. It's it's good. It's worth tracking down. It's fun. It, it also does it make sense for him to cross over with the turtles too because they both have in, like roots in Frank Miller work. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, where turtles were kind of a parody of Daredevil as well. Obviously, a little bit looser, but that's why it's the foot instead of the hand. Splinter they have the same stick. Yeah, splinter instead of stick. The same ooze bounced off Matt Murdock's face and like went into the sewer and mutated them. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's it's just a fun Batman parody, and the art is really good. Um, if you're looking for something that's maybe more, hmm, it's like if you use the '60s Batman show as a, a starting point, like the comics go in a different direction and like this is if they like went the opposite way like how can we make this more insane yeah okay i gotcha it like ramps up the silly aspect of it yes but in kind of a tasteful way okay worth tracking down if you really want to that's no. out something different. Well, hopefully we got people interested in some Batman books. Yeah. Batman Day. That's yeah. Cool. It's, Are it's, y'all doing anything at the store? Yeah. Well, so this is coming out on the same day, so you might have missed your chance if you're not listening to it as the minute it comes out, like you should do every issue of it. Um, but there's gonna be some free books. Um uh we have a couple other things to give away. There's a couple of special edition uh comic issues and like there's a special slipcase edition of Batman 89 where it's the movie poster on oh, the outside. Cool. Or so it's just the logo. Um, but all of our DC comics and graphic novels are by two, get a third free. So, you know, that way, in theory, you load up on Batman stuff, but you can get other characters too if you'd like. They also just recently put out a bunch of really cool Batman trade paperbacks, not specifically for this day. But we just got the omnibus of uh, Batman Adventures. So it's like all of the classic TOS not TOS, uh, TAS comics in like one giant volume. They put out a uh, slipcover edition of Batman 89 and Superman 78, which is cool because they're the hardcovers and under the dust sleeves and the hardcovers, they were always designed as VHS tapes. So the slip, cle- slip sleeve like for the cover is the uh, is like a VHS like cassette tape like cover. Like it says instead of uh, home movies, it says like home comics on the side and then like it's hi-fi is like CMYK. Says so, you know it's printed like there's a lot of little elements like that that make it really fun. That's really cool. But they're both really good, and it's a good way to buy both of them like right off the bat. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of fun, fun Batman. Get that Batman Adventures. Yeah, it's really cool. It's also humongous. It's like forty comics in one. That's really cool. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so you know, hopefully, you listen to this early enough in the day that you can still take advantage of this. Uh, either and i'm sure whatever local comic store you you have will probably have something going on at least have the books that are uh, uh giveaways there's also a um a hollow foil like reprint of the first issue of jim lee's hush so like, you can buy that as well that's yeah. also like a batman day exclusive thing um i don't think it's batman day like printed in general but they're just like they're doing a new printing of a uh, batman number one facsimile edition we'll have that as well so it's like a reprint of 
Batman number one, but including the ads. Oh, cool. Yeah. The facts only editions are neat. And now Marvel's yeah. doing them with new covers and uh, no ads, which is like, what's the point of being a facsimile edition then? Yeah. Just release a clip. Well, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They're just regular reprints then. What makes the facsimiles fun is like they have the old ads, like they're presented in the way that they originally were. But yeah, so that's Batman Day. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Um, I I was nice talking about uh, Batman in a more broader sense. And like in talking about this with you, like, man, there's a lot of like nostalgic connections to some of these stories that I don't think I really realized and appreciated until just now. Yeah, I I am kind of tempted to read a bunch of Batman books, honestly. I'll be honest with you. I might do that once we uh, get off camera here. I really want to re- reread the Ninja Turtles ones now that we're talking about it. I might I might like two a lot more now that I don't like my expectations are tempered, you know? Yeah, I wonder uh, going back if I'd like that more. Yeah. Um, yeah, I might dig out my uh, Batman TMNT adventures. Just I totally don't even remember what that story is about something the crime does something that's all i know yeah i know it just has to deal with like universe shenanigans and then i remember issue issues like one to three or one to four all of it is like set in the original like batman the animated series kind of setting at least all the batman stuff until the last issue which is Batman the New Adventures. Yeah. And I thought yeah, that was like a flash forward, right? Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, the remember... turtles are the same. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that being kind of funny. But yeah. Uh... But yeah. Well, happy Batman Day, everybody. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back at some point with whatever episode is next. I think this is going to come out uh, in between uh a couple of episodes in 66 um cool. but yeah this we didn't record it that way but yeah, yeah so this is so this is a special a special release it's also a special day of the week it's coming out on a saturday instead of wednesday um you know again it felt silly not to mark the occasion in our batman podcast so yeah we'll have to We'll have to go harder next year. Yeah, but I thought this was fun. And like I said, it's a fun change of pace. I also reaffirms my love for comic books. Yeah, as hard as I am on them, I do. It, it comes from a place of love. Like they, sh- they could be better. They should be better, you know? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, we'll talk about that at a different time. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Gotcha. Gotcha.